Hello, my name is Rebecca Osborne. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Guelph, uh, and my research tends to focus on ecotoxicology and multi-generational effects of contaminants. But today, given the topic of this conference, um, I thought it would be fun to look at the true heroes of my research, um, which are the freshwater mollusks. Uh, they tend to be really, really important in our ecosystems, but are often forgotten in research, and a lot of people don't know very much about them. So today we will be celebrating <laughs> freshwater mollusks. Um, I like to start off just going over some of the taxonomy um, because sometimes people can be kind of surprised to find out just who's related to who in the molluscan phylum. So we have uh, mollusks as the phylum and that's divided into three major classes beginning with the bivalves. So bivalves are essentially uh, any mollusk that has two shells. So you've probably seen uh, these around in one way or another. Um, we've got things like the freshwater or marine clams and mussels, um, also oysters and scallops, giant clam, for example. And then you might be more familiar with things like invasive species like the zebra mussel or perhaps a plate of PEI mussel. Then the next major class is the gastropods. Um, this is actually the largest class of the molluscan phylum and involves animals like uh, marine and aquatic, um, as well as terrestrial snails, slugs, things that are snails that you don't realize are snails, like the conch. And then a wonderful group of organisms called the sea slugs or the nudibranchs, uh, which tend to be really vibrantly colored and have some great names, like my personal favorite, the sea bunny. And then maybe most surprisingly, the last major class is the cephalopods. Um, sometimes you forget that these guys are actually related to the mussels and the snails because they include things like um, the octopus, the squid, and nautilus and cuttlefish. So these are our three major classes of the molluscan phylum. And they're actually all really, really important and, ha and have had some major historical importance to humanity for quite some time maybe most notably would be the uh, mollusks as a source of food. So you've probably had mollusks in some form or another, escargot, oysters, clams, mussels, calamari, etc. Uh, they're also really important in many of our industries. So pearls all come from uh, bivalves. And before we had synthetic button making, um, buttons would actually be punched out of the shells of mollusks, as you can see in this picture here with the holes in the shell, uh, because the inside of that shell is really shiny and beautiful. Uh, and then the other one that's really important uh, that I learned about this summer that kind of blew my mind is dye making. So if you've ever heard of purple being associated as um, a royal color, there was this specific dye called royal purple, and it was really, really difficult to obtain, so it made it very expensive. But as it turns out, uh, it actually comes from snails. So the process was really long and disgusting because it involved fermenting rotting snails for many, many days, uh, and that's what made it so expensive to get. So there you go. Um, and then also invasive species, they're really important, but maybe in sort of a less good way, um, they can be really damaging to a lot of our ecosystems. Uh, so that's of note as well. And then not only are mollusks and freshwater mollusks um, culturally and economically important, they're also ecologically very important and provide many ecosystem services that we rely on. So freshwater gastropods can actually represent up to 60% of the benthic invertebrate biomass in abundance in some rivers. And adult freshwater mussels consume and filter out the water and they can consume, or they can filter up to uh, 40 liters of water a day. So our freshwater mollusks are really the key um, recycling and filtration plant of the water that we have. And they're basically there and they're consuming dead and decaying organic material and filtering out those particulates from the water. Uh, and that's allowing those organic elements and nutrients and energy to get turned back into usable energy and transfer back up the food web. So they're really, really important. Um, and then they also serve as food, which is important for the health of our ecosystems and contribute to healthy sediments in our rivers. Uh, they also have really important research value and maybe not in the way you'd quite expect. So freshwater snails like Limnaeus stagnalis have actually been used for quite some time in neuroscience research. This image here shows you the um, cerebral ganglia of a Limnaeus stagnalis. So they have these big chunky ganglia that are all um, attached in a ring and serve as sort of a prototypical brain, but they're really easy to look at and manipulate. And that's what's given us some major insight into human memory and um, neuron and brain activity. 
And then along the lines of my research, uh, freshwater mollusks are also considered a canary in a coal mine. So if you've ever heard that expression, it just means that they can kind of tell us uh, just how healthy the ecosystem is that they're living in. And when the mollusks start to not do so well, we know that the river is not going to be doing so well. Uh, we can also take them back to the lab and they serve as model organisms for lab-based toxicity studies, which teach of, uh, teaches us about um, the potential risks that contaminants might pose in the actual ecosystem. But unfortunately, despite the fact that they are really important and really interesting and diverse, they're actually some of the most imperiled and at-risk organisms that we have in North America. So this graph just shows you a breakdown of the percentage of species listed as vulnerable, imperiled, critically imperiled, or presumed possibly extinct. And freshwater snails and freshwater mussels um, have the highest percentage of species listed as at risk compared to all other taxonomic groups. Uh, and then if we break it down a little bit further to look more closely at the freshwater gastropods that I study, they're actually disproportionately at risk of extinction. So they've had way more extinctions compared to um, all mollusks as well as their terrestrial and marine gastropod counterparts. And over 70% of North American gast freshwater gastropod species are considered at risk. And the story isn't a lot better for freshwater mussels. Uh, we actually have 55 species of mush fresh freshwater mussels in Canada, which is one of the highest species diversities in the world. Um, and 41 of these species can be found in Ontario, with all but four that can be found in the GTA. And we have 15 species at risk of freshwater mussels in Ontario. But unfortunately, of all of the animal extinctions we've had on Earth, 42% uh, of those species were mollusks. So that's a disproportionate risk of extinction compared to all other organisms. And 99% of those molluscan extinctions were non-marine. So our freshwater mussels and, plant and gastropods are really in trouble, but people don't really know about it. And so that's actually shown here. Um, this pie chart shows us the representation of uh, different taxonomic groups in ecotoxicological data. Uh, according to the US EPA Ecotox database. So arthropods are the largest, most diverse um, phylum on the planet. And they're represented in 33% of the records, but mollusks, which are the second largest group, um, they're only represented in 5% of the records. And there are even fewer records for freshwater gastropods with uh, less than 1%. So they're really important and uh, they're going extinct at an unprecedented rate, and yet we don't have enough research about them. So some of the major threats that they're faced with right now uh, include habitat loss from dams and stream channelization, which causes habitat fragmentation. Um, invasive species are an especially a big problem for our freshwater mussels. So the Dreissenids, like zebra mussels and quagga mussels, can outcompete our native mussels for food and resources. And as you can see in this image here, um, they can actually stick to the shells of our native mussels to the point that our mussels can't open anymore to breathe or eat. And there have been some evidence for uh, negative interactions between invasive snail species like the Chinese mystery snail and our native snails. And then again, getting more into what I do, uh, deteriorating water quality is a really big problem as these organisms tend to be quite sensitive to water quality and pollution um, and just of interest for Ontario and Canada in particular, but one of the biggest concerns right now in this field is freshwater salinization due to road salt runoff. So one of my favorite things about this work, um, because we, uh, because snails have a relatively short lifespan and generation time, we're actually able to study the multi-generational effects of contaminants, um, which we can't do for every animal just given how long they live. So for my, one of my studies, we took uh, adult snails and exposed them to three different levels of copper for seven days, and then they were moved to clean water for 10 days for a recovery phase. And in a normal test, since they all survived and recovered and looked fine after that recovery period, you could probably conclude that these are relatively safe levels of copper or that the ecosystem could handle that. Um, but what's interesting is the snails are teaching us that's not the full story. So we take it out to the next generation, they have their babies in clean water, and then we take these babies and, and expose them for the first time to copper. And what we found was that uh, the babies who were born to parents exposed at the highest level were much more sensitive than ones who were born at lower uh, exposure levels or to unexposed parents. And then lastly, uh, 
my other favorite thing about working with these animals is they lay their eggs in these um, flat, clear jelly egg masses, and we're able to see through them and take pictures like this one of the developing embryos. Um, and so this, we're trying to come up with uh, brand new endpoints we can use in toxicology that are hopefully uh, non-lethal and maybe more sensitive to different contaminants, and then maybe uh, incorporate these endpoints into our multi-generational studies as um, early warning signs of when there has been historical toxicity uh, that might make the next generation more sensitive than we would expect. So I hope you've learned something uh, interesting and new about freshwater mollusks um, and maybe have a little bit more of an appreciation of these often neglected critters. Uh, and thank you for your time.